Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Rebecca Cohn. I'm a librarian here with Palo Alto City Library, and we're really excited today to have with us Jillian Guthrie, author of Alpha Girls, The Women Upstarts Who Took on Silicon Valley's Male Culture and Made the Deals of a Lifetime. Jillian worked as a journalist at the San Francisco Chronicle for 20 years, earning numerous awards and nominations for the Pulitzer Prize. She's the author of two other best-selling books, How to Make a Spaceship and The Billionaire and the Mechanic, the Alpha Girl story of four women who survived and thrived in the high stakes, male dominated world of venture capital makes it a perfect nonfiction selection for Silicon Valley Reads 2020 in our theme, Women Making It Happen. We want to thank our friends group, Friends at Palo Alto Library, for co sponsoring today's event and for all the support they provide to the library. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Julianne Guthrie to our library. Thank you. Hello everyone, it is great to be here and it's nice to see so many faces. It's such a beautiful day. We have a lot of competition uh, outside. <clears throat> so I am the author, as Rebecca said, of actually four nonfiction books. And my first one is a little gem. Um, it's, it was called uh, The Grace of Everyday Saints. And it wasn't as big and, and uh, commercially received as the others, but it's a really wonderful, small, smaller book, but beautiful story. Uh, and I am just finishing, I'm on deadline now for my fifth nonfiction book, uh, which will be out later this year. So if I'm a little delirious or hoarse sounding, it's because of these relentless deadlines. Um, that I inflict upon myself, I must say, being an obsessed storyteller and a lover of the written word and a believer that books are little pieces of immortality. And I take great pride, which is why I didn't want to let, let my first child, so to speak, my first book go unnamed. Um, Alpha Girls, having said that, Alpha Girls is the book that really changed the way I look at the world. And, you know, all of these books are great gifts to me, and I hope to the reading public as well. But Alpha Girls was the book that opened my eyes to where women are, where women are not, what are the obstacles, and really how women can succeed in industries dominated by men. Uh, and that remains today the majority of industries. So the book, um, was first published, gosh, almost a year ago, which is hard to believe, uh, last beginning of May, end of April, beginning of May. And while I had been a journalist for all of these years and I had covered business, and to some extent Silicon Valley, I had not really immersed myself in, um, in the world of tech, startups, and particularly in venture capital which is what I wanted to look at, get kind of into this niche with this story. Um, it was during the publicity tour for my third book, How to Make a Spaceship, uh, which is this really wonderful story about Peter Diamandis and his quest for a private path to space and really laying the groundwork for what you see today with Elon Musk and SpaceX and Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, Richard Branson, Virgin Galactic. But it was on that tour where I would be speaking to groups, big and small, and I would look out and there were so few women. And these were entrepreneurs and these were engineers and these were um, aerospace folks and rocket, rocket uh, scientists. And I was like, where are all the women and why are there so few in these really dynamic industries? So that got me thinking about um, this next book and this next story that would become Alpha Girls. And we all know or have heard, especially you're in the epicenter here, the stories of the disparities just in women in tech. But I wanted to find kind of a different way in and focus on this industry of venture capital that maybe is not well understood, especially outside of this area but has enormous influence really on how we all live. Uh, you know, picking, financing, mentoring, helping build uh, some of these really critical companies of our day. And then the next generation companies. 
And what does it mean when 94% of all check writing venture capitalists are men? Uh, what does that mean and when only 2% of venture capital dollars historically have gone to women-founded firms? So with that 94% figure, I, I said, well, 6% are women. So who are they? How do I find them? How did they do it? Uh, what were their obstacles? What were their lives like when you know our lives get more complex when we have kids and partners and um, maybe sandwich generation? And what happens when you're the only woman really at the table competing for these deals again and again with men? And you don't have that network even. At the time, these women really didn't have uh, a network as is being thankfully established today. So I wanted to tell their story in a very novelistic way where we get into their successes, yes, but also their personal lives because you can't really separate the two. And I wanted to tell the stories of, again, how they navigated with children, with working spouses, partners, um, and when they were betrayed, when they made mistakes themselves, uh, getting them to actually open up and be vulnerable about their regrets and their betrayals and their broadsides was the hardest thing about this book. It was very interesting for me having spent a lot of time in my career interviewing you know, these uber successful men who are much more at ease, if you will, telling their stories of regrets and even vulnerabilities. It's maybe a little contrarian, but getting the women who had to be so strong all the time and so unflappable with these kind of Teflon suits, getting them to share their stories of hurt and mistakes and betrayals, uh, it was a very interesting process. It was a very challenging process. Um, I'm going to start uh, because we are in a library, thankfully so, um, by doing a little reading. So I'm going to introduce you to the four main characters, and these are real women, but they're definitely characters. And as a storyteller, from a storyteller's perspective, they're really wonderful characters and you go on an incredible journey with them and you meet the men in their life who were fantastic allies and you meet you know some men and women who were did not behave so well but um, I'm going to introduce you to them and then I'll tell you why how it was that I chose these four women because obviously there are many more women I could have chosen from even among that six percent um, but when I first heard um, MJ Elmore, who you're going to hear about first. So MJ Elmore, she was from um, Indiana and she went to Purdue and she worked, her, she worked uh, night, uh, the night shift waitressing to kind of make her way through college. But when she told me that uh, she, how she, what she had driven West in, and how she arrived here, I was like, oh my gosh. As a storyteller, I was like, that has to be the opening scene of the book. So it is the, um, the prologue. I'm gonna read you two paragraphs from that. Sand Hill Road, Menlo Park, California. Mary Jane Elmore was giddy as she looked down at the rusted out floorboards of her old green Ford Pinto. She could see the road rushing by below, but she wasn't driving on just any road. She was making her way up Sand Hill Road in the heart of Silicon Valley, about to start a new life intent on changing the world. A pretty young woman with brown hair and brown eyes, Mary Jane had graduated from Purdue University in 1976 with a degree in mathematics. She paid for her car by waitressing during college summers, wearing a small orange romper that prompted oversized tips. Her beat-up Pinto, which leaked radiator fluid and still had its original Firestone 500 tires, had taken her nearly 2,000 miles from Kansas City to Northern California, 
where she had landed a job at an eight-year-old technology company called Intel. So that's your first introduction to MJ. Now meet Magdalena Yashiel. It's fun for me to read these. It's revisiting kind of how I saw them when I first met them. Magdalena Yashiel. Breathless from her bike ride across campus, Magdalena Yashiel arrived for work at the Stanford Computer Center wearing a white floor-length gown and yellow daisies in her hair. It was 10 p.m. and the room was full of men, playing Dungeons and Dragons and working on their engineering thesis and dissertations. Magdalena smoothed her dress, unpacked her bag, and sat at her desk. The sign on the wall behind her read, Computer Consultant. It was late spring 1980. Magdalena, Magdalena worked the night shift at LOTS, Stanford's low overhead time sharing center where she fielded predictable questions and laments from students, such as, I ran out of allocated memory, my software keeps running in an infinite loop, and I can't log into my account. Magdalena herself was anything but predictable. Already striking with long, thick, reddish-brown hair and hazel eyes, she attracted even more attention wearing ball gowns and tiaras to work, or 60s-inspired fashion. She loved geometric dresses, patterned tights, paisley pantsuits, and anything with daisies. If she had to endure the boredom of these graveyard shifts, she was determined to keep herself, at least, if not those around her, entertained with her whimsical costumes. So that is Magdalena. Next, we get to meet another amazing individual. I hope you'll love all of these women as much as I do, and they have so much to, to teach. They're a lot of fun. Teresa Gao. At Oliver's, a popular water, watering hole in Providence, Rhode Island, Teresa Gao ordered a beer, greeted the blue collar and student regulars, and headed to the foosball table. It was time to kick some butt. Teresa hated to lose, whether at foosball or anything else. At the foosball table, with her best friend Sangeeta Bhatia playing defense, Teresa went quickly on offense. Her unwitting opponents saw her permed and teased hair, stirrup pants, an oversized sweater, and thought she'd be a patsy. But she had a killer spin shot, a great pull shot with the middle man on the rod, and a surprise bank shot. In short order, cocky contenders came and went, dispatched with ease before they knew what had hit them. Standing five foot three and still looking like a teenager, Teresa was constantly being underestimated. It had been no different at the bar a few blocks from Brown University where she arrived in 1986 to study engineering. Teresa had grown up in a tiny working class town in the tiny working class town of Middleport, an agricultural crossroads about 40 miles northeast of Buffalo where many students dressed for school in camouflage, read Soldier of Fortune magazine, and skipped school on the opening day of deer hunting season. Graduating seniors typically enlisted in the military or went to work in the local General Motors factory or at the sprawling Farm Machine Corp plant that manufact manufactured pesticides. For the Gao family, however, education was everything. When Teresa got an A-minus in Spanish, her father was furious, telling her, I know you're smart enough to get A's in everything you do. He did not believe in the concept of extra credit. It's not extra credit for you. Anything your teacher gives you is required, he said. Teresa lost sleep over tests and became depressed if she got anything less than 100%. Her mother, more relaxed than her father, would tell her, 95 is an A. It is enough. 100 is for the good Lord. <laughs> Tells you a lot about their background. So now the fourth um, alpha girl who you're going to meet is a woman named Sonia Howell. Today, Sonia Howell Perkins. In 1989, 22-year-old Sonia Howell had been working as an analyst at the venture capital firm TA Associates in Boston for several weeks, yet she still didn't have a chair for her desk. The secretary wouldn't order her one. Sonia didn't dwell on it. She was just glad to be there. 
Before starting at TA, she had heeded her mother's advice to cut her hair and wear glasses. You will be treated with more respect, her mother had advised. In the same way, when she heard that her fellow analysts were getting together for scotch after work, she quickly joined, feigning delight at what she found to be an awful tasting drink. Nothing was going to dim her love affair with the venture capital industry. It was a perfect place for the cheerful, blue-eyed southerner who liked to say, my obstacles are my allies. But before long, Sonia's naturally sunny disposition took a hit. Standing upstairs in TA's gorgeous wood-paneled offices, she looked down the spiral staircase and realized she was the only female investor in the Boston office. Am I here just because I'm a woman, she wondered. After a few days of sulking and second-guessing herself, she looked in the mirror and said, snap out of it. There was no point in looking for discrimination, she realized. Life was too full of opportunity. So that is the introduction to these amazing women who uh, arrived on you know, this, this canvas, so to speak, of Silicon Valley, where we are here at different times, different eras, uh, with very different backstories, but very shared dreams. And I found them by first interviewing the founding fathers of Venture Capital, and they are all men. So I went and interviewed Arthur Rock and Bill Draper and Pitts Johnson and Don Valentine and several others, uh, Reed Dennis at IVP, and asked them about the history of venture and you know, really how it was built up and heard wonderful stories there from these pretty legendary men and asked them who were the women that they knew had done the most significant deals uh, and were still in the industry. So I started compiling a list of names, primarily women in Silicon Valley, also some on the East Coast and some in Southern California. Um, but they had to have something, a company, uh, a company that became an industry that was irrefutably theirs, where they were the lead, where you know other people at their firm had turned turned them down, or they were just repeatedly turned down uh, by other VCs in the industry, in the area. So uh, they had to have a company again that became so significant, uh, either on its own or led an industry that was theirs, and. Long, I, they needed to have great longevity in the industry as well and still be in it today. I wanted that. And, but a little bit of it was there was a certain amount too that was, a, there was an element of risk in, in, uh, in writing, in selecting them because I don't know how much you all know about the book process, but you write a proposal and maybe that's 10,000, 12,000 words. And so you know a good deal about it, but you haven't written, written the story yet. And so there are all sorts of surprises that await you inevitably. Um, but I had a feeling about these women and I loved their backstories. I loved their different paths. Uh, their family stories I thought were really, really rich. Um, and then again, the companies, the, the role that they played was really significant and continue to play too today. And then the changes, how they changed, how they were dramatically changed by this industry that while there were moments of letdown and betrayal, while they're still in it, they love it, they're shaking things up, they're changing it for the next generation who are women you know, coming up in the industry now. Um, so MJ, who you see in the Ford Pinto first, um, she will, so she works for a little bit uh, for Intel for a couple of years, amazing experience. And then she goes back to get her MBA at Stanford. She's just graduating from Stanford uh, Business School when she hears of a job at IVP, at Institutional Venture Partners. And she's, she has good technology experience having been at Intel. Uh, she's a natural at math. 
Uh, she's you know about to get her MBA, but her colleagues, mostly men or her 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 peers at Stanford, tell her, Reed Dennis is never going to hire a woman. Why even bother going to the meeting to the interview? And she, having been very accustomed to this sort of thing, just said, "Well, I'm going to go anyway, and it may be informational for me, or I'll I'll get a tip on something." And she was undeterred by this comment. Uh, and so she went to the interview, met Reed Dennis, and they talked for several hours there in his office. And by that afternoon, he had offered her a job. And she will go on to become one of the first women uh, to make partner at a venture capital firm in the United States. And her story takes us um, through some of these early software companies, hardware companies, uh, backbone internet, internet sales companies, and where she really specializes and uh, charges ahead. And then we will see her as she marries, as she has one, two, three kids, as her um, husband is also a full-time venture capitalist, and we see her juggling all that um, parents do, particularly mothers, even with two working uh, partners or spouses. The woman does about 75% of the work at home, something that often derails women and really needs to change. But we see MJ struggling with uh, how to balance, probably sounds familiar to all, uh, how to balance these things and why is it when even though both of them work full time, she's the go-to mom, uh, she's the go-to parent if, you know, heaven forbid something breaks down, the washing machine, you know, it, it's uh, whatever it is, she's the go-to person. And not only that, when her marriage starts to falter, uh, she is the one who will uh, start to step back a little bit to work on the marriage. And no one said to her, you know, MJ, why isn't Bill doing this? Uh, why doesn't Bill step back? Or why doesn't he take on more responsibility? And she never asked him to. So she says today, and he's a great guy, and I don't know if any of you know him here, but I've gotten to know him. But she says, she doesn't blame him, she blames herself because her overachieving, as she calls it, enabled his underachieving. She never asked for help and she never asked, you know, she never put a, you know, whatever you, if you want to call it a honey to-do list or anything. She just did everything. I think sometimes we think it's easier to just get it done ourselves rather than uh, delineate or delegate or ask for help. But we see what happens in that, in that scenario, which is all too real, all too common for uh, working families today trying to figure this out. There was a story in the New York Times, I think earlier this week, on the um, uh, millennials and assuming household responsibilities. And while there are more men who are coming up in their 20s now are more accepting of childcare, um, they still are not ones to um, ever offer to vacuum or do any of the cleaning or anyway, it was an interesting study because you would think we'd gotten past that and uh, these most recent studies suggest otherwise. So that is MJ. Um, Teresa Gao is an amazing, uh, is an amazing story. I mean, from I, I'm drawn to underdog stories in all that I do. So if you think about The Grace of Everyday Saints, my first book uh, about a group of Catholics who fought for more than a decade to save their historic church, to uh, The Billionaire and the Mechanic, and Larry Ellison's, uh, you wouldn't think of him as an underdog, but as, as his really underdog quest to win the America's Cup when he lost it twice before he won it uh, the third try, and partners with this definite underdog, radiator repair man who was Commodore of the Blue Collar Boating Club, the Golden Gate Yacht Club. So underdog there, how to make a spaceship is the quintessential underdog story of this boy who dreamed of getting to space and creating a private path to space that, and a, pr a private industry that didn't exist. Uh, so then Alpha Girls, of course, Teresa's story, and all of these women really, um, given what 
the statistics that I started out talking about, the 94%, and it's such a networking industry. I mean, they were definitely underdogs and remain so. But Teresa, so she grows up in that blue collar town and um, her first job was flipping burgers at Burger King. And you got a sense from what I read, uh, you know, her parents and her dad was very, uh, had very high expectations. I won't say demanding, but very, very high expectations. Teresa gave a TED talk where she said, and I paraphrase, um, that an A minus was nearly scandalous, a B was off the charts, and a C does not exist in, um, in, um, in, the, in Mandarin, or what, it, she was like, it just doesn't exist, it's not possible. So very high expectation sort of family. But Teresa, um, Teresa's story is one also of great determination and one of working harder than just about everybody around her. So she, after graduating from Brown magna cum laude, engineering degree, uh, and she had started at Brown feeling very much like this country bumpkin uh, because she hadn't gone to a, an elite uh, high school. So she gets there and, and she figures it out, obviously. she exceeds magna cum laude and then she moves to um, she comes west and she starts at stanford also gets her mba there again these women are at different times um, sonia who you had heard about at ta associates had just gotten her mba at harvard um, but teresa gets her mba at stanford then she goes to work for a startup during the dot-com boom the startup fails but it's an amazing experience for her She's zooming all around the valley trying to sell this concept in this little, you know, red Acura. And uh, so after the, after the startup, she joins Excel Partners, a venture capital firm. And she looks around and she realizes she needs to bring something unique to the table. Super competitive, um, really successful firm. And this was again toward, this was around 1999. So height of the dot-com boom and some of the folks in her office, including wonderful uh, man who was really a mentor to her, Arthur Patterson, um, was doing some work in cybersecurity, which at that time was more of a backwater, was not what it is today. And she, with her engineering background and with background she had at the startup, she sets out to really specialize in cybersecurity. And so she takes classes at night and she goes to all the networking events and she's the only woman really at, at uh, these huge events and gatherings. And, but she makes it her specialty. And she learns of a certain entrepreneur whose name is uh, Shlomo Kramer, who's kind of a rock star in that industry. Uh, he, their paths cross through work, and Teresa heard he was about to start a new company. And so she proactively uh, found out when he was going to be in New York and said, I will take you around to the Wall Street banks so that you can have kind of this, uh, an early focus group and talk to the folks at Goldman Sachs and at Citi and at Morgan Stanley. And so she set up these meetings and he said, great. So they went around and he presented his idea for the, for the fire, new type of firewall protection. And it turns out that uh, he, the company started, it, its name was Web Cohort, and it becomes a comp big, big company called Imperva. And Teresa got the deal to become the first investor. Um, but also some, some things happen along the way with that deal, in particular as I think about it. Uh, all of a sudden it was, who is Teresa Gao and how did she get this deal? And Teresa heard through a male ally of hers, a great guy, who's a very big name in the venture industry today, um, heard that the guys, some guys in the valley were ta saying negative things about her and how she had gotten the deal that she had flirted or slept her way somehow to this deal. So this ally, which was preposterous and um, offensive, but this ally told her, this is what the guys are saying. And so in this situation, you know, as a woman, what do you do with that information? You know, do you get so discouraged that you 
uh, step aside? Do you ask who are they and, and I'm going to confront them? Um, or do you just plow ahead? And Teresa just continued on and landed, you know, it was almost it was almost a galvanizing force, like, okay, so you don't believe me yet, just wait. So she will go on to, uh, to do, you know, significant deal after significant deal and really let it go, just let it go. But she was really happy that she had an ally who told her that and also one who, uh, as I hope more and more men do, and that is say that's unacceptable uh, behavior or that's an unacceptable statement. You know, she is, uh, she's an amazing venture capitalist, an amazing talent, an amazing engineer. Um, but Teresa had an ally and at least she heard about it. And then again, it's, this book is very much about the strategies, the mindset. I believe mindset is everything. And it was the mindset that these women had to navigate these tricky situations, knowing when to use humor to diffuse tense situations, knowing when to let something go, like those comments, and when to escalate it, um, finding commonalities with the, the men around them, because it was all men, um, you know, where it was more commonalities, being a part of the team. They figured out strategically, you know, really key ways to become a part of the team. And Teresa, uh, from that, that young woman whose first job was flipping burgers at Burger King, today she is called America's most successful female venture capitalist, which she bristles at the qualifier. She's like, well, I'm competing with the men, why? you know, just female, but it's okay. Uh, she has amassed a net worth of over $500 million, so rather phenomenal success, uh, similar with these other women, but just that, that, that journey that she goes on is so incredible. Um, she now has her own firm here in Silicon Valley. So that's Teresa. Um, Magdalena is a pretty extraordinary story. How many of you know have you heard of Magdalena Yashiel? Any of these women? So that's so interesting too, is that these are, you know, very much these hidden figures in the industry. Oh, she did. Oh, in. Oh, neat. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. So um, Magdalena Yashil came from Istanbul, Turkey, and you saw her in this scene at Stanford where she loved to wear these uh, flamboyant costumes to keep herself entertained. So she gets an electrical engineering degree at Stanford and she works for a semiconductor company and then becomes an entrepreneur. And then I'm gonna flash forward. She's a venture capitalist at US Venture Partners. Um, and she will become, well, she, there's, a, there's a really key meeting that, um, that happens for Magdalena. She, uh, through her own companies that she has built and sold, she's gotten to know some folks at Oracle, including uh, a guy named Mark Benioff. And um, he's, a big, uh, he's her contact at Oracle for her company. And they had remained friends, and he trusted her advice. And one day he called her and said, you know, can we have lunch? I think they went to the Burlingame Country Club. And he said to her at that time, he was still at Oracle, he said, I, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking about starting my own company and doing kind of what Tom Siebel is doing, but uh, have it software as a service, pay by the drink, pay only what you use, rather than these huge software licensing deals that you had to get into where you used 10% of what you bought. And so he said, do you, can I do it and should I do it? And Magdalena at lunch said yes and yes, and I will help you raise money. And that afternoon, uh, she was on the phone with their first hires, including Parker Harris, who today is the CTO of Salesforce. 
and she, Magdalena, that girl who arrived from Istanbul with $43 to her name and nine gold bracelets to sell if needed, uh, will become the first outside investor and first board member of Salesforce and help build the company really from that conversation over lunch to through IPO. And she is on her fourth startup today, uh, is a really incredible woman, has a book out uh, of her own, which is called Power Up. And, um, but she, she really, you know, her story is also interesting. I referenced the getting these women to talk about their regrets and their missteps was very difficult. One interesting story that Magdalena told me was when Salesforce went public in 2004, I believe it was, um, 2004, of course Magdalena was supposed to be there and Mark wanted her to be there. And she, um, the day before she called him and she said, one of my kids is sick, I can't make it. She had two boys. And Mark was like, what, really, okay? And didn't quite understand it. Um, and Magdalena you know, said, I'm gonna be watching from here and you know, it'll be great. But when I did ask her you know, what were some of her regrets, she said, I regret to this day that I was not there. I cannot for the life of me, this is what she says, remember which kid was sick. And he survived, whichever one it was. I should have delegated. I should have asked somebody to step in so that I could be there that day. And not only because it was a moment of victory for herself, but now she sees the importance also of um, the stories we tell and our, the way women are represented in the media and not represented. And you know, just those pictures, when you Google, um, you know, Salesforce IPO, you know, you see all of the people standing there at the dais and, and having, you know, another woman there is just more affirmation. It's just one more layer, I think, in this, in this very important dialogue. Um, but that's Magdalena. And last but not least, Sonia Howell. I have a really fun story to tell about her. So she comes, she leaves TA Associates, she gets a job at Menlo Ventures, she's on, she's a, a partner track associate, and she's 28 years old, and she gets invited on this banking boondoggle with uh, Tom Weissel, hard charging, super successful investment banker at the time, and he invites everybody to Sun Valley, uh, flies a lot of people out, and she's there, and she is in the lodge, She's done her morning of skiing. She's like me, where it's après ski is the best part, and in the lodge and all cozy, and thinking she's done for the day. And she's one of the few women there, except for the spouses and, and assistants. One of the few uh, working women who were there. And, but up saunters Tom Weissel and says, Sonia, I've signed you up. You're in the race. And she's looking like deer in the headlight, you know, he's surrounded by his posse. And it's again, one of those moments where, like Teresa faced with what do I do in this moment? And all of these women had similar situations. Sonia, you know, looked at Tom, looked at the guys, thought I could, you know, I could decline. Maybe I have work to do in my room. Maybe I'm not feeling well, but she said, great, I'll be there. And so that afternoon she's up, you know, on this icy slope and they've set up the shoots with the flags. And she, Tom Weissel, uh, for those of you who had not heard of him, he was known for taking former Navy SEALs and former Olympic athletes and the, turning them into investment bankers. And so hyper competitive and very physical. So she is competing on this icy slope literally against a former Olympic skier named Otto. Of course, you can't make these things up. That's why I love nonfiction. And she's in her, you know, black puffy Patagonia jacket, and she's looking down at, you know, this very treacherous, very steep, icy terrain with the chutes, which she's never done before. And she told me she was feeling very much like the Grinch's dog, Max, looking out, like sure this was not going to end well. And she has that saying, obstacles are my allies. She's one of the most relentlessly optimistic, positive people I've ever met. 
At first, I thought this has to be a show, uh, that no one can be this positive, but she really is. She was the one who said, snap out of it. And so she takes off, and she's just going to snowplow her way to the bottom, if need be, just to get there safely. She's like, I don't care. I'm just going to stay upright. I'm going to make it down the hill. I'm going to focus on where I want to go. And she made it down the hill, alive, no falls. Uh, and there was Tom Weissel and you know his crew, and everybody's giving her high fives. And there was a victory in that moment, but it extended beyond that because the most coveted seat in the house, which all of these bankers had been like, when no one was looking, you know, changing the name cards at dinner, where they could sit was to be seated at Tom Weissel's table. And Sonia that night was seated to his right at his table. And it established this networking for her that would not have happened had she said no. So she, she also has a saying, you can't win if you don't play. Uh, and she advises women to get in the game and find these commonalities as well. So in that case, you know, a win for her was uh, a win that continued and that went on in a way represented um, how other women might uh, respond in the same situation. So that was Sonia. And Sonia will um, fund a major company called F5, and that was a load balancing company, and a young entrepreneur named Jeff Husey, who was from Seattle, and came by the way of a love of video games and investment banking, and he hadn't started a company before, and he was nervous as all get out when he came to present. Uh, to these VCs and, and pitch uh, in his raise. And the other partners weren't so sure, and Sonia was like, absolutely, the internet is just coming on, online um, in terms of e-commerce, and she saw that as a big thing of the future and, and, and a real need for load balancing software because it was, things were being slowed as there was just mass move online. And so she helped, uh, she was the first investor in F5, which is today, a, I don't know how, how many multi-billion dollar company. And she also invested in a young, kind of unorthodox uh, in terms of the typical path to entrepreneurship investor uh, named Andy Ori, who started a company called Acme Packet and then had a company called Priority Call Management, which sold to uh, Oracle for maybe 300 million or some significant number. And today she's investing in Andy Ori's third company uh, called 128 Technologies, which she said is going to be the biggest yet out of Boston. So she has stayed with uh, certain entrepreneurs that she's known from her very first days there. And Andy Ori told me a really interesting story about, I said to him, what was different about working with Sonia? And as far as, was there anything related to her gender that you would kind of call out? Like, did she act, you know, obviously this is kind of generalizing, but what did you notice? And he said something very interesting. He said, Sonia is the only board member who ever asked me um, how I felt after a board meeting. She would always say, call me the next day, you know, and to debrief, but I'll say, how do you feel? How did you feel about it? How do you feel about things? And he said that was so savvy because not only was it a good business question, because you want to know how your, you know, the CEO, the entrepreneur is feeling about life, um, but it was also kind and there was empathy there and the, it was genuine and, but it gave Sonia a lot of information that he just had never been asked before. And it seems so simple. Uh, but Sonia also will, uh, just to, I'll wrap up here and then I'll open up to questions, but Sonia, uh, you will see her in the story uh, hit with a crisis. She is diagnosed with very aggressive breast cancer at the same time she and her husband are adopting a baby. And so what happens now when she, at that time, when she, after she's diagnosed in the middle of, you know, she doesn't know what her chance, she knows what her chances of survival are and there's a, it's not the greatest and yet she's adopting this baby and then she goes back to her office and she's surrounded 
by only men, and she feels very alone. And she had lived with this reality, but she hadn't been hit like it this like this before, where suddenly it was, you know, she felt she was dealing with a very female um, challenge of breast cancer and of adopting the baby at the same time and having no support system. And in this book, you see this um, development over the years, but very slowly, of a support system that just didn't exist for the women that slowly began to take hold and that today is so much stronger, actually pretty strong, thanks to a couple of organizations, including one that Sonia founded called Broadway Angels, which is an all women's investment platform. Um, and all raise kind of the political arm of this movement to bring more women entrepreneurs and more women venture capitalists in. Uh, but Sonia, in that moment, you know, was again, what do I do? Do I step out? Or she took it as, a, as kind of a uh, universal intervention and she didn't want to be so, feel so alone. So she founded this all women's investment platform and she founded a nonprofit called Project Glimmer, which I think today has given out something like 500,000 uh, gifts to at-risk young women, a lot of foster girls. Uh, so she wanted to create this network of, of support for women and for girls. And so the universe intervened, as she says it, as the optimist that she is, and kind of set her on this new trajectory uh, while she remains a venture capitalist today. And all of these women are connected now through this network and through this cause of bringing more uh, gender diversity and uh, racial, ethnic diversity as well into the world of entrepreneurship and you know the companies that are being built trying to get more women founders and then more women on the funding side as well and a more diverse rep representation and really to show that while there were a lot of challenges and difficulties to show that it's a great industry for women and they love it and it's not all the terrible um, um, situation and, and it's not as bad as it's de depicted. There are a lot of challenges, uh, but they love it. And they want more and more women to be at the table in creating these next generation companies. And we know that um, despite the still pretty grim statistics around women matriculating up the leadership ranks, uh, only about 15% of the top managers across industries are women, and there are a ton of really dismal statistics out there. Uh, but these women, I feel like, really had the mindset, um, the strategies, kind of the eyes on the prize mentality to make it work. They are this great playbook, if you will, for how women can succeed in these industries that are still heavily dominated uh, by men. So I'd love to take any questions from anyone. Don't be shy. Yes. So um, if I understand well, oh. if I understand well, is your group of people mainly like Northern California? And it was like a geographical choice as well, or? In, they're all here now. Uh -huh. Yes, they're all in, in the Bay Area now. So that was one of the criteria about when you were picking people that they would be in this area? Well, it's the center of this mm -hmm. industry. For the venture capitalism. Yes, mm -hmm. it's this place where all of these amazing things have happened and continue to happen, we hope. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for talking about your other works. and. Uh, uh, I wanted to know, you, you mentioned that they all had an underdog aspect, mm -hmm. and I'm a real sucker for an underdog myself, but I wondered uh, how the marketing, research, writing, and uh, um, I had a fourth point, but I don't remember it, how that differed for this book from the other books that you've written. Um, it didn't really differ, but... Um, I would say the reception for this book has been definitely off the charts where, uh, you know, the book came out a year ago and I'm, I'm booked through um, 
the summer, uh, which is so unusual for books. The book has been turned into a television series. Um, it's been adapted by an Academy Award winning woman producer and TriStar Television. Um, we have, we're working on live, um, uh, Alpha Girls festivals, live events across the US. I founded a nonprofit institute called the Alpha Girls Institute to enable and support women and girls to succeed in male-dominated fields. And now I have the bug, and I'm starting my first startup that's related to the content of, of Alpha Girls. So it's changed me, as I said, and it just has organically um, developed into, gone into all of these different places that I didn't imagine. So it's really fun to start as a storyteller, which I remain, and then to see it kind of take me on this unexpected journey and so the reception to it has been um, really gratifying. And, um, and it, you know, the timing is right for it. The, the spotlight is on. You know, we had the Me Too movement. We still have that where all of the, you know, a lot of uh, bad characters were outed. And then what I see Alpha Girls at is as kind of going beyond that, looking at, yes, we have bias. Yes, we have sexism. but we need to have focus on mindset, mindset strategies, navigating these situations, no excuses, and that's what uh, these women did. So, so it's more, again, the reception to it that has surprised me. It wasn't different, the reporting, the writing, the difficulty, except for what I said with, it was more difficult to get the women to, um, to really be forthcoming. I have a saying, uh, you have to be brave to be vulnerable, and because that these women are working in the industry today, so they need to continue you know, their relationships with these guys. So how much can, finger pointing can you do? How much naming names can you do? Um, you know, that you, in any industry, but I think especially this one, you're relying on, hey, Sonia, this is a great deal you might be interested in. Would you like to get in on this? So you need that sort of networking. So that was the big difference for me. It was very tense, yeah, with the women. So, a, a follow-up question there uh, about what you just said. Uh, did you have a sense that, uh, that the, uh, there was a way that these women managed to become one of the boys, you know, that, uh, to be accepted in the, in the sort of, uh, uh, hey, Sonia, you want to get in on this, um, as opposed to ostracized? Well, they, um, you know, they, I believe that there are no shortcuts in life, and they took that as well, that they really went out of their way to make sure they knew their stuff, and they specialized, and they um, deflected more than they protested, really. Um, they, you know, when Teresa, when there was an off-site, um, um, intramural, they had an intramural flag football game, for instance, uh, which I hope you wouldn't have today. It's kind of ridiculous, you know, for you not to think maybe the women or woman <laughs> would want to do this, but, you know, Teresa got in there and, uh, you know, played flag football, and fortunately for Teresa, she can throw, you know, a spiral as good as some of the guys. Um, so, you know, Sonia did her downhill ski racing, uh, Teresa, you know, played the intramural, you know, football and uh, could, you know, um, super, super competitive. Uh, Magdalena is an interesting story of knowing when to take issue with something and when to let it go. She was at her first job out of Stanford. She was at, um, um, she was at a sales conference in Hawaii and it was all, it was at a semiconductor company and she was, it was all uh, men. There were maybe five women and you know 800 men, something crazy like that. And the entertainment, the entertainment, dinner entertainment was were strippers, and so you know, and not just strippers. It was like pornographic acts. She said, you know, she's not, she's fr from Europe, and so she's used to seeing like some level of nudity, but not like that. And so that was a question of, do I take issue with it? There's my boss across the room, um, or do I let it go? And she was so offended because it, was, it wasn't just, I don't know what would be okay, but um, I'm sure there are gradations of okay. And so then she decided she would go over and she would not confront, because that's not how she looked at it, but talk with her boss, Jerry Sanders, um, 
pretty famous guy in that time. And she went over and she, you know, um, kneeled down next to him and she said, I want you to know, you know, I'm Magdalena Yashiel, I'm a new engineer, you made a big deal of hiring, and um, this act made me very uncomfortable. She, her goal as she was walking over there to talk to him was to make him um, feel that her problem was his problem. And it was not to be confrontational. It was to say, this made me, someone you so wanted to hire, feel so uncomfortable. And, um, and he said, you know, he didn't first quite know what to do with her, <laughs> like she was speaking another language. And then he said, um, you know, Magdalena, why don't you, I'm, you know, I'm sorry about that. Please join us at our table tonight. And then he said, well, I know that a lot of our clients would enjoy having the company of a pretty woman. And so it's like, oh, no, you were ahead. Um, but so in that case, she doesn't say anything because she has already made her point. So it's like picking your battles, right? You've, you've protested in your own uh, graceful way this striptease, but you're going to let that comment go. So it was all of these decisions um, that were very, very strategic very strategic, very well thought out, uh, and the take, you know, issue with something and when to let it go. MJ one day was tasked with firing a, uh, a male entrepreneur uh, that she had hired and, or that she had funded the company, and the company was underperforming, and she finds out the guy is sleeping around, is sleeping with some of his employees, and so she goes and she's meeting with him one-on-one -on -one in a room, and she tells him, um, you know, the problem goes, goes over the problems. He's missed earnings. Uh, and then he said, she said, I know that also what's happening on a pers personnel level and a personal level. And she says, you're fired. And he looks at her indignant and he says, I'm not going to be fired by a woman. And she's thinking, okay, he's okay being funded by a woman, but he won't be fired by a woman. These are all true stories, amazing. So in that situation, again, though, you know, do you escalate the situation? Do you say, you know, that's the most preposterous thing, I'm offended by that, um, I'm gonna report you, whatever the options are. Instead, she looks around, you know, looks to her left, looks to her right, looks him in the eye, they're the only ones in the room, and she said, I'm the only one you've got, you are fired. And so then when word of this got back to the firm, and they didn't know how a woman would do in firing uh, a male, um, very swarthy entrepreneur. And so it became kind of, not legend, but it was like, oh, look at how swiftly and deftly, or how deftly she handled this. You know, she kind of did use humor. She didn't let it really get to her. Um, and he was fired. So they all figured out these ways. MJ also did, though, speaking of kind of finding these common out, or being one of the guys, um, MJ, you know, who had come out in this Ford Pinto and had hair down to here, and she would find at her first board meetings and other meetings she went to, if she was wearing a dress, that the men would always comment, oh, MJ, you look so cute. MJ, I love your dress. MJ, I love what you're wearing. And so she soon realized that what she was wearing was a distraction. And she, uh, she decided to cut her hair. So she cut her hair up to here. And you look at some of those pictures uh, that you were looking at. And she's kind of in her, it becomes almost interchangeable, which she said she was not doing now, but with the guys. She adopted the boxy suit. She cut her hair. But it was because she wanted to be focused. She wanted the focus to be on what she was bringing to the table, not, she, not what she was wearing. And it really worked for her. Um, you know, I don't think that it's quite the same today, although there are definite uh, dress standards that you can't deny. So she did do that to become one of the guys, and it worked. You know, is it giving up too much? You know, Teresa, when she started in venture capital, at that time, um, the wardrobe was khaki pants, blue button-down shirt, not necessarily the best look for women. Uh, Teresa did it, you know. She, but she would never give up. Uh, she has a thing for high heels, and she would and expensive shoes, and she would never give up her, you know, her fancy shoes. I liken it to how 
Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, she wears the robe that was designed for the men. It has the cutout in front for the tie. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg puts those beautiful ornamental collars on, almost in this act of defiance, almost in this act of, yes, I'm going to, you know, wear this robe that was designed for a man, man but I have my own kind of statement uh, of defiance or identification. And that was Teresa with her shoes and I think RB. RBG, kind of the similarity there. So playing within a system, learning to play by the rules that existed uh, as they navigated their way to becoming the trailblazers they are today, but really making it work within the system that they were in. <laughs> yes. So thank you for this experience. I'm halfway through and, and oh. being able to hear you expand is, is I hope I didn't give away too much I'm still going. <laughs> <laughs> okay um, you mentioned earlier about the surprises of the writing and we are introduced to these incredible figures and as you said there was a piece of um, um, there's elements to every one of their stories that may or may not want to be shared did you have surprises with other characters that you never got to sh write about because they didn't want to go as far with you in the storytelling of their experiences or? I did, well, in my early outreach, um, I reached out to a, um, a very, a cast a wide net. Um, and there were two women who were very prominent in, venture, prominent in venture capital who want to write their own book, kind of a Thelma and Louise of, hopefully not with the same ending, um, <laughs> of venture capital, but not really. Um, you know, some have their own things in the works, and so they didn't want to share their stories to that level. Um, but these women, they didn't really want to share their stories to that level either. You know, it was a, it was a negotiation throughout, up until really publication day, um, where one in particular was um, CCing her attorney when she was emailing me and which is never a good sign. <laughs> it was fine, it turned out great. It was, it was just concerns, you know, it was just, um, you don't know, you know, you put all of this, I have so much respect for her and for the others because they were willing in the end to be super brave, to be really brave and tell their stories. And I understand now, well, I didn't necessarily understand it uh, when I was in the midst of it, I understand now completely because they're not, they were not public figures, and yet they were revealing so much, and so much apprehension around that. You know, you don't know how you're going to be received, you don't know what the fallout is gonna be, or can you still work in the industry? Um, are you gonna be taken seriously? Who's gonna be offended that you may never suspect would be offended? Um, you know, people always read stories differently. I learned that as a journalist, that you can write something and there's no harm intended, and then the person who you reference in one sentence will go apoplectic. Um, so um, I didn't have, no, I didn't, I, I had the challenge with, with these women and we worked it out and they're very proud of the story today. And I'm very proud that I was able to tell it. Did you have to withdraw any of the stories? One story um, over just potential um, litigation uh, where it was just a financial issue, uh, an issue, super interesting story, super juicy story, but um, uh, around equity and carry and something that happened at a firm and someone going after somebody else's equity. Um, it was good stuff, but uh, I felt like I had covered it in kind of different ways without getting into the details. So I think that was Oh, there were some other things, yeah. <laughs> now that I think of it, some marital things, uh, yes. But um, so, so I would strike a balance. Erring always on the side of authenticity and including as much detail without harming anyone um, unnecessarily. Because um, there are always multiple sides to every story and Someone asked me recently if I had a regret, if I had any regrets, or if I'd had more time, what would I have done differently? I think I would have spent more time with um, the partners, the husbands, 
um, you know, I think that's really interesting. Uh, and, the al and the allies and the, I mean, I interviewed them all, but it, that would have been interesting. Yes? I'm pretty fast. Um, it took about a year to research and write, and then it took about, uh, you know, it takes a long time for the publishing house to publish it, so like nine months after that. So under two years. Mm -hmm. Yes? How, how has it been received in the, in the ages of uh, 30s, uh, Girls, I'm. I'm just wondering. Mm -hmm. I have three daughters, mm -hmm. 34, 35, um, and one. One of them is the wife of my son, and um, I personally, when I was in my career, I chose to not, you know, get that super high job because I wanted to stay mm -hmm. home with the kids, and now I'm like thinking. Well, now. I am an empty nester, now I'm, oh great, I have time to do what I yes. didn't do. But uh, I'm like thinking, I could have done it yeah. also mm -hmm. at that time. And to me, that is, you know, this is like, yeah, I want to tell my daughters, go for it, mm -hmm. you know, totally. You, you know, you, you can have both, mm -hmm. you can have everything you want. So I'm wondering that age, because that's like, like I'm going to, probably get it for them, but you know, what has been the reception in that age bracket? Um, super positive. And that's, I, if I were guessing, I don't know what the, demo, the age demographic breakdown is, I would guess that between 20, um, that that age group is a, is a huge consumer of the book. And whenever I do talks, I do a lot of corporate talks, um, I am besieged by women in 20s and 30s. What do these women in co have in common? What are the takeaways? What are the lessons? What advice would you give for, what about when I'm you know, asking for a promotion? Um, how can I be heard at the table? Um, you know, how can I network after hours in the era of Me Too? Um, you know, how do I find an ally? Can I have a male mentor still? And men asking me similar questions as well. How do I have a closed door meeting? How do I have, so um, there's, a real, um, there's a real sincere hunger for it. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, it reads very novelistically, so it's not as if each, you know, story ends with a summary of here's what to do, but you get it. Yeah. I hope they benefit from it. And I hope you find, so MJ calls, um, I think she's, old, she's older than you are, but MJ calls um, the, the period of life she's in now at, you know, in her early 60s as the third trimester. And she believes in this pivot, you know, where she wants to have, she expects to, hopes to, you know, have 30 years left. And so what is next? And reinvent yourself, you know, at each stage. And so she's really doing that now in her investing as a, you know, taking up oil painting, um, investing in companies she had never gotten to invest in when she was at IVP, things that are her personal passions. Yeah, last, last month, my grandmother turned 103. <gasps> and I'm wow. like thinking, okay, I am 50, I just turned 58. I'm just like, I have a whole yes, lot of time yes. in front of me. So it's like, I can do so much. I have so much time, you know, as long as I have health. So that's been like a yes. big, you know, like, I mean, for the past few years, I've been like starting things that I would have never thought that mm -hmm. I would. Uh, but it's like with that spark, you know, that so, super new energy, like, okay, now. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I good. Can go for it. Yeah. Yes, yes. I narrated, um, I think just the author's note. Yes, I narrated some part of it, but not the whole book. But I hope you enjoy. I love listening to the audiobooks as well when I'm puttering around. Yeah, are you an audiobook? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you did it yourself? No, I didn't do the whole thing. I did, um, I did the author's note. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, venture capital is a very powerful field. But in uh, finance, business, and uh, venture capital are considered kind of pink collar 
compared to the tech world. And I wondered if you had any sense that these women all started out in tech, but only real men develop, right? You know, Did they feel pushed, or maybe they found more headroom in the venture capital side of things than actually in development? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, Magdalena remained very much in the de on the development side, um, more than a venture capitalist uh, as a multiple uh, serial entrepreneur. Um, I think they each found their niche. You know, like MJ's niche was, um, you know, who were the customers. She came at it from a um, kind of a marketing, more of a marketing standpoint. Um, where you know she would invest in entrepreneurs where she knew where they proved that there was a customer base in place um, they all had different methodologies but i don't think they were steered i think this was this was just an um, a niche that they were really good at and that they really loved they loved this combo of um, kind of parachuting, and it's very similar to journalism in that way, where you parachute into all these different fields intellectually. You learn a huge amount pretty quickly and assimilate the process, the information very quickly and make a decision, uh, talk to a bunch of people. and But then you have some, um, you know, you need to have this sense, like good people skills as well. So they were really good at it. Like, you know, is this entrepreneur for real? Can you count on this entrepreneur? you know, male or female, do you believe in him or her? Um, so having these people skills too, where they were really good at uh, selecting who uh, they would invest in. So I don't think they were really on these tracks to be hardware developers or software developers, except for Magdalena, who's um, kind of dabbled in, in, actually she was less of a venture capitalist, as I said, and more of an entrepreneur on the development side. Well, thank you all so much. It has been a pleasure to be here today and nice to meet all of you. And I'm very easy to reach on LinkedIn and otherwise. And I'm a big fan now of Silicon Valley Reads. I find it uh, so impressive all that they do and bring to schools and libraries. I was at a school and a library and a museum last week as a part of this. And it's just a pleasure. Um, and impressive. And of course, anytime I can come to a library, I'm always happy to. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for your presentation and everyone for your great questions. Uh, thanks for coming today. Remember that um, there's lots more Silicon Valley Reads events throughout uh, the end of this month and next March. So our flyer listing all of those is in the back. I also have a short um, oh. evaluation I'd love to have you do so we know how we did and how to keep in touch with you for um, future events. Um, so thanks very much, everyone, for coming. <laughs>